I'm Amanda, and this is Not Your Granny's Quilt Show. Welcome to today's show. We have Anne Scahill of Crafty Moose Quilts with us today. Strap in for this one. We get real, we get raw. Um, if you've got like medical or health stuff going on, um, maybe you're tender about it, maybe you're not, but we get into some of that. So if it's not something you want to hear, maybe skip this episode. But I also um, know that I find strength in finding and talking to people who know what it's like to experience health challenges and, you know, have, have your body give up on you or betray you in some way. And, um, and just where we can find solace in having our hobbies and creating community outside of that to find meaning and purpose in all of it. So I hope you do listen. Um, I hope that you, if you don't know what it's like, you can find some understanding for people who do face these challenges because it's invisible, right? I mean, not always, but like, anyway, I hope you enjoy this episode and let's just dive right in. Alert, it is almost time for QuiltCon. And if you're going to be there like me, I want to see you in your Not Your Granny's Quilt Show merch. So head over to the pop-up shop. It's nygqs.printify.me to get your merch before we all head to QuiltCon and we can show it off to each other. I am so excited. I'm going to have stickers. So don't buy them if you're going to be there. Cause if you find me, I'll hand you one. Um, or you can just buy them cause you want them. And I'm just so excited. So head over to nygqs.printify.me today to get your merch. Have you joined Patreon yet? Well, if not, now's your chance. Head over to patreon.com slash not your granny's quilt show to join today. When you become a paid patron, you get a Not Your Granny's Quilt Show sticker sent right to your door and you get exclusive early access to episodes. So head on over to patreon.com slash not your granny's quilt show and sign up today. Hi, Anne. How are you today? I am very well. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. Thanks for being here. I'm, I'm, I was just recently introduced to you through your sweater weather sampler with your nine patch quilt collective friends and talked to a couple of them and started seeing your work. And I was like, wow, I need to talk to her now. I'm like working my <laughs> way through everyone. So <laughs> I'm just so glad that you're here. Thanks. It's a really great group to work your way through. There's, there's not a bad egg in the bunch and everybody brings something completely different to the table. And it's, it's an incredible group of women. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody seems great. And I do like that. Everybody has like a little bit of a different flair in whatever they're, you know, whatever they present to the quilty world. So I just, I love that, that, you know, there's such different vibes that can all come together to create something so cool. So yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, awesome. And, um, so we've chatted a bit before, but, um, we're going to just take it all the way back to the beginning and let our listeners in on some of our conversation. And so I like to just start with everybody letting, letting us know like how you got into quilting or where sewing entered your life. And, and we'll start from there. Yeah, sure. So, um, I grew up the youngest of three girls and my mom and my grandmother sewed everything. And I mean, everything curtains, bags, clothes, swimming suits, like all that they sewed everything. There was not a thing that they were afraid to sew. And I hated all of it. <laughs> <laughs> I hated fabric stores. I hated trying on things that they were making and there were pins all up in them. And, you know, I just, I hated all of it. I was definitely a tomboy. I loved to be outside. I loved to be in the dirt. I loved getting sweaty. I loved like just the different scenes and smells throughout the day. You know, I just, I loved all of it. I just wanted to be outside and, and doing things. Um, so I did not get on the sewing wagon <laughs> my entire childhood, <laughs> early adult life, none of it. Um, it was really probably, I'm not exactly sure how old I was actually. It was 12 years ago. So I would have been 34. Uh, I was diagnosed with several different autoimmune diseases and 
I spent a period of time where I had to step away from my job. I worked in children's ministry at the time, Mm -hmm. um, had to step away from my job and I really could do nothing. My goal every day was to rest and take care of myself. Mm -hmm. And I am not very good at resting. (laughs) I am a mover and a shaker and a doer and a thinker and a button pusher and all the things. Um, I have a very hard time just putting my own oxygen mask on and taking care of myself. Um, So in that time, I had this defiant moment. Um, My grandmother had passed away in, I think it was three years prior. And my mom had let me borrow the sewing machine. I I had a little, a fun group in the neighborhood. Um, This might be before your time, but there was a movie that came out. It was called Julia and Julia. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of okay so it was you know about Julia Childs and yeah always had an apron and pearls and the thing so we had this grand idea that we were gonna make aprons and wear pearls and watch the movie together and it was a total hoot and I was like wait I have access to a sewing machine so um mom brought over granny's sewing machine and um after that little apron event which mine turned out horrible but I still have it. I can't let go of it because it has such fun memories with that group of girls in my neighborhood. Um, But she, you know, I never took it back to her house and it was just sitting in my closet. So when I had this period of time where I was essentially bedridden, um, I really could only do like one task a day. Mm -hmm. And that was for months. Oh my gosh. It was so long that it felt like I could really only do one thing a day. Mm -hmm. Um, But as I was as I was beginning to heal and really get out of the hot zone, I don't know, you know, for anybody listening who has autoimmune diseases of any kind, um, you tend to have these flares where it just kind of feels like the bottom falls out and Mm -hmm. it takes a lot of time and effort to get back to a place where you can function well again. So as I started to function again, I happened to walk by my um, craft room office one day and I saw the sewing machine sitting there with a box of fabric that came directly from granny's apartment before she passed. And I was like, I can make a quilt like they did. Mm-hmm. I could totally do that. So I pulled it out and <laughs> I opened up YouTube and I just started to dig and figure out things and cut things. And it was horrible. My first quilt is horrible and I still have it and we still use it and I still love it. Mm-hmm. Um, my biggest fear the whole time was the bobbin running out of thread. <laughs> right? That's so scary. You're like, what do I do? (laughs) Exactly. And God bless her. Granny had a whole box of pre-wound bobbins. And I was like, thank you, woman. (laughs) You're like, somebody does love me. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Oh my gosh. She set these aside just for me. I know Mm -hmm. it. So, um, you know, I had to call my mom over and I was like, Hey, I need your help with this thing. Cause you know, I was too proud to tell her like, Hey, I've actually been sewing. So she came over and she was floored. I mean, the woman did not stop talking the entire time. I just can't believe it. I just can't (laughs) believe it. And I'm like, yes, mom, I got it. You can't believe it. But I could not figure out the borders, you know, how to put Mm -hmm. borders on this. I did not follow a pattern. I didn't, Mm -hmm. I didn't understand anything in a pattern anyway, but I was like, how hard could it be? to cut things into different squares and then sew them all back together. Like, how hard could that be? So (laughs) I didn't know anything. I didn't know what a quarter inch seam was. I didn't know why it was important. Mm -hmm. I didn't understand why pressing was important. Like I have, I've come a long way. (laughs) Right. The journey (laughs) was long. Yes. Like It's funny. Like I always talk about how, cause I've been quilting for probably, I think six and a half years now. Um, like just, I, grew up like you with mom who sewed everything and I would get her to sew me projects and things like that. But I was, I had way too much anxiety around using her sewing machine and messing it up. And so I just would never like touch it. And so when I did finally start in my thirties also, like, because my best friends forced me, she was like, are you kidding me? And so I can, (laughs) I can relate on that, but it's just, it's so funny to look at like my very first quote, which again, like you, I still use, it's still on my bed it's falling apart in some areas, not as bad as some of my other ones that I tried to do on my own because my friends held my hand the entire time I made that first quilt, (laughs) but it's crazy how quickly you can progress in something that seems so daunting at first, like knowing those quarter inch seam allowances, knowing my pressing is so important, knowing how to even just trim up fabric. I just like think back to the, that very first 
experience with my friends. They're like, okay, hey, we're going to teach you how to square up your fabric. And I was like, what are you talking about? You just cut it, right? They're like, nope, here's how you use the cutting mat and the ruler and the rotary cutter. And I was just like, how like weird and new that seemed. And now it's like, all I do is cut fabric and sew it back together all day long. And to think about how much I didn't know then and how much I do know now, I was like, it's like, I have to stop sometimes and be like, oh yeah, like just a few years ago, I didn't know any of this. And it's crazy that I'm like a business and I'm like, trust me, I'll make you this fancy quilt. Anyway, anyway. <laughs> I totally get that. And I think as a, as a pattern designer, and we'll kind of, we'll, I'll backtrack in a minute to get back sure, to sure. how I got onto that journey. But yeah. as a pattern designer, I like to try to keep those things in mind when I'm writing a pattern. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, you know, the, the makeup of a quilt might be a beginner pattern, right? So like the design is not complicated, you know, you're not using 60 degree angles or, you know, whatever. Um, but I think that in the wording and in the diagrams, sometimes designers can write things in such a way where it looks like a beginner, but it doesn't read like a beginner. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important to kind of marry the two things. Yes. Um, and it's interesting in the Nine Patch Quilt Collective, we've even had, gosh, we've had so much conversation over good conversation over diagrams and wording and just, you know, all the different things. And I think... I think it will be rare for me to produce things that are above intermediate, you know, mm -hmm. like I might have a few intermediate, but I think for the most part, part, I really enjoy writing beginner level patterns because first mm -hmm. of all, I like things fast. I think we've already covered the fact that I can't sit still. So <laughs> I like a project that starts and ends fast. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, oh my gosh, God bless her. My mom finished every single one of the quilts that my grandmother had started. And one of them was this intricate leaf pattern. Mm -hmm. um, oh my gosh, it was crazy. I don't, I'll try to find you the link because I know it's still out there. I just saw it recently and I sent a link to my mom and her brother. She actually <laughs> finished it for her brother. And okay. I was like, holy cow, remember this whole thing? And my yeah. uncle was like, oh my gosh, Judy, you are a saint. <laughs> I can't believe you put that together. I'm like, you have no idea how much of a saint she really is. Right. So anyway, um, you know, those things are beautiful and they're incredible. It's just not, I'm not built that way. I'm mm -hmm. not built for the long haul intricate, this is going to take me 11 months to put together. Yeah. I am much more the, I'm going to start it on Monday and it will be to the long arm quilter by Tuesday afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's, yeah. that's my speed. That's, that's more what I like. So that's typically what I'll tend to produce, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And I, I, to touch on that same kind of topic of like, I heard the quote when I was probably four four years into teaching of my eight years, eight year yeah. tenure. Um, <laughs> but it was the concept that like, it's good. Cause I stayed in third grade the whole time I taught. So I did eight years of third grade and every year I'd like joke with my students. Oh, I've been a third grader nine times. or I've been a third grader seven times. <laughs> like, Why cute. Um, anyway, but just the idea that like the more expert you become, the more removed you become from the learner. So like they were essentially saying that if like those teachers who've stayed in the same grade level for years and years and years can forget what it's like to be new, to be, it's their first round. These kids are eight. They, you know, they've not experienced multiplication before. They've not experienced certain topics before. So like if you get, if you're getting frustrated or you find yourself like losing your patience with your students and their, their learning process, like you, if you're forgetting, it's like easier to forget that they are doing it for the first time versus you doing it for your 10,000th time. Like, yeah. so that humility to stay with your, with your audience, right? Like with your, your quilters who want to follow your patterns or your students in your class, or even, you know, the people who, if you're giving a seminar or a talk or teaching any kind of class, it's like, you have to remember, like, maybe people don't have as much time as you. And, and yeah, if you're, if you, you're reading a beginner pattern and you're so excited because you're new and you want to try these different things. And like you said, it doesn't read like a beginner pattern. It really puts people off of quilting. Like 
they think, oh, I can't do this. It's too hard. I can't even read a pattern when really the writer didn't adjust to the level of pattern that they produced. So, right. It's that, that catchphrase of know your audience, right? Yep. Yep. For sure. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, on that same topic of being a beginner and getting frustrated in the beginning, I think that, um, I think in general, especially with the invention of social media, Mm -hmm. we have a tendency to put these expectations on ourselves and even on our people, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I have one son, he's 20, he's he's inching up on 21, which is crazy, but Mm -hmm. um, you know, all through his childhood, I can remember times like, gosh, even he was a really late walker. Mm -hmm. And I could remember thinking to myself, like, well, so-and-so son walked at nine months. How come he's still not working? Like there must be something wrong with him. And you know, he, he does this, there must be something wrong with him. And he does that. There must be something. And it's like, oh my gosh, no, it's just who he is. Right. And God blessed me with probably the most incredible woman ever in my life. Um, her name's Jennifer. She and her husband and my husband have very similar, um, they met at work and Mm -hmm. they have very similar jobs, which, (laughs) we're not going to get into because it can be kind of a touchy topic for some people. It's, Mm. it is law enforcement related for both of them. So they have moved around the country and they're currently stationed in Hawaii. Mm. Horrible hardship, right? Oh, terrible. Um, (laughs) But she is my person that I can call and I can say, oh my gosh, I think that my kid X, Y, Z, or Mm -hmm. oh my gosh, what is wrong with my marriage? Because blah, blah, blah. And she, she doesn't say anything mean Mm -hmm. or ugly or what she just lets me say all the things. And Mm -hmm. then she'll come back and she'll say, okay, now that you said them all, which of those things are actually true? Mm -hmm. None of them. None of those things are true. That's all of your emotion talking. So Mm -hmm. let's wait a day until the emotion wears off. And then let's circle back and let's have this conversation again. And I'm like, (laughs) can you please never leave my life? I'm going to need you forever. (laughs) Right. (laughs) So it's like that little, (laughs) like that friend embodiment of like a conscience or like your good angel, like on your shoulder who can love you in whatever state you're in, hear you and then say, okay, here's, here's reality. Here's what we're going to come back to the present and we're going to look at the facts and we're going to decide if there's anything to be done or, you know, what yes. you think you need to do, what do you, what's your responsibility essentially? And you're like, Oh, right. <laughs> like, yeah, those friends are priceless. And yeah, my, my three girls are the same way. It's like, I can tell them anything and, and they're, they're going to listen. They're going to be in my corner and be ready to fight whoever they need to fight, but they're also going to keep me grounded in reality, which is so, yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. If you have that person hang on for dear life, because <laughs> it's, yeah. It's helpful. And especially because comparison, I think there's time for comparison when you're thinking like, you know, for maybe safety reasons or maybe like making good decisions, like trying to be informed, but then there's comparison to feed our our egos or to feed some kind of spiral that we're in some emotional thing, like you said, and and comparison, I know that the quote is out there, but um, comparison is the thief of joy. It's looking for reasons to not allow yourself to feel joy and, and feel happy in your life. And instead of looking inward and at yourself, it's looking at everybody else. And I think a lot of, you know, quiltstagram, if you will, is can be so hard to look at sometimes, especially when you feel like you're maybe not moving as fast as some people seem like they are, or, you know, I don't do a lot of personal sewing because I'm, I'm busy sewing all day long for my business. And so when I get home, even though I might have grand intentions, when I leave my workplace, which is my mom's house, but you know, still to sew and I step in my home and I do nothing. Like I check out of sewing completely. And then the next morning I'll be like, Oh my God, I was going to make that thing. (laughs) And so that comparison can be really hard because I'm like, I'm not making as much or I'm not, you know, showing as many things that I'm sewing. And, and then I'm like, oh, right. I'm actually really, really busy sewing and I'm making a lot of things that are challenging my skills. I just don't necessarily show everything because 
also being able to do social media at the same time as creating all the things I'm making is daunting for me. It's just not in my mental capacity to be as prolific as a content creator as some people are as well. So anyway, enough about me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, going back to where you said comparison is the thief of joy. I think that comparison begins the path of these expectations that we start to build up. You mm -hmm. know, it's like, it's like these check boxes that we feel like we have to check. And mm -hmm. um, when we find that we either are unable to check them or we don't check them, it makes us feel less than. Mm -hmm. And, you know, then I hear stories of like, I just can't find my people and I can't find my community. And I kind of want to tell those people, you know, especially in the quilting world, circle back. Like, mm -hmm. what are you, what are you projecting? Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times what you're projecting is what you're attracting. Yep. So perhaps there's some healing or something you need to do within you. Um, I cannot I cannot say enough about therapy. Yeah. It helped me through an extremely traumatic experience. I was hospitalized with COVID mm. in 2021 and oh it was, God. um, that was tough. I'm not going to go into those details because I'm, I already have mascara on and I already cried it off once and reapplied. So we're not going to do that today. Okay. Um, but it was extremely traumatic and, um, I dealt with a whole host of physical issues and, um, PTSD and all the things and, um, mm -hmm. therapy was a godsend for me. It gave me the right Avenue to say mm -hmm. all the things that I was thinking and feeling and, um, helped me to process things. She challenged me. We read a bajillion books together. Like it's, I can't say enough about therapy, but I think sometimes if you're having a hard time finding the right people in your life and you just can't find you know, what we started calling your people or your tribe. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there's probably some healing that might need to happen on the inside. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's why you're having a hard time finding people because you're projecting something that's attracting the wrong crowd. Right. And, um, you know, sometimes I catch myself, like I'll say something. Um, for example, there's a friend of ours, um, she and her husband recently brought up, bought a property and they're completely flipping the whole thing. And it's mm -hmm. going to eventually be their retirement location. And it's amazing. And <laughs> they started like a little social media group on Facebook. Cause you know, I am the, I am the Facebook generation mm -hmm. and I'm not ashamed, <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's like a little, little closed group where they post op updates and whatever. And they got so much done in one weekend like literally a Saturday and a Sunday. Mm -hmm. And my comment that I posted was, dang, we can't even fix, we don't even find the time to fix the things that are tiny around our house. I'm so impressed by you guys. And then after that, he replied and he was like, I don't even know what to say to that. And I was like, why did you say that? That was so about me. And that was not at all about their house. Right. So anyway, lots right. of tangents within there, but basically going back when you're, if you're having a hard time finding your quilty people, Mm -hmm. Um, I really do think that maybe there's some internal work that needs to yeah. happen. Yeah. Um, but they're out there, they're, yeah. they're there and they're waiting for you. They just don't know they're waiting for you and you're waiting for them and you just don't realize you're waiting for them, but they're out there. Yeah. Thousand percent. Like I, I am in that same boat. I cannot say enough about therapy and, and, you know, there's always the hashtag quilting is my therapy. And it's like, there are therapeutic benefits to making and creating and sewing and, and quilting is one of those avenues, but there's literally nothing that can replace that relationship and that growth and that change that can happen from therapy, from an unbiased, unconditionally accepting support that can look you straight in your face and be honest with you and hold you accountable. And, um, I've had the same therapist for ugh, probably almost five years now. It was like, well, four years. I don't know. It was like right, kind of right before COVID happened. And anyway, it's just, there's nothing like it. And even if you have friends and family and people that you have a support network, it's not the same. It's not... Yeah the same relationship and, and maybe you have really great friends like your Jennifer. I also have a Jennifer in my group of really good support friends. It's like, they all have their shit too. They all have what they're going yeah. through too, their therapy, their, their own issues. And so sometimes it just feels like, oh, I don't want to burden them with it. 
when really I could talk to them about it. And I do usually still anyway, even with therapy, it's like I share, oh, in therapy, I talked about this with my therapist and this is the solution we came up with instead of saying, well, here's all my crap. Like you fix it for me, (laughs) you know? Yes. So, so I think you're right. Unrealistic expectation. Yeah. That (laughs) healing of being able to say, oh, I perceived this in this way, but here's the facts and here's, we call it our mindfulness exercise, me and my therapist. And it's yeah, yes. first step is when I start to get into, we, I call it a shit spiral. She calls it a anxiety spiral, whatever words are words, right? Um, Semantics. <laughs> right. Um, you have to, I, like, I have to stop myself and start the process of think if this thing is true. What are the facts? So that's first step. What are the facts? Second step is what, um, what responsibility do I have or no, that's third. Second is, um, is there anything to be done? Like, can I do anything about what's happening about the facts? Could I change anything about it or is what's done done? And then it's deciding your responsibility. Do I need to do anything? do I need to apologize? Do I need to clarify? Do I need to just step away and leave it alone kind of thing? And, yeah. um, so anyway, that was again, my own thing that I had to work through because I would get in these spirals of like taking everything personally. And I think that's where a lot of people can get stuck. And I think that's where I see a lot of like tit for tat things going around online or, you know, people share like, oh my gosh, can you believe this comment? And it's like, it's always that, like that person is stuck in their own way and they're making something about them that isn't about them. And instead of just letting it go by, because it really is insignificant to them if they just let it go, but they turn it around and they make it about themselves. And so, and, and comparison is that too. You're making something about yourself that isn't about you. Or it doesn't have to be about you. If if it is, it is. And if it's not, it's not. But you have to be able to discern the difference. And if you're locked in to your, you know, these behavioral patterns that keep you in those thought processes, like it is hard to find your people. Like I used to think everybody hated me all the time. And I was so anxious about everything all the time that I couldn't have friends because I was always reading into everything they were doing. And when I was able to step away and stop doing that and realize like, oh, they're not doing anything to hurt me. Like I'm perceiving it that way. It like opened up a whole new door yeah. to like a new life. I feel like I, for you. My, I feel like I like split off into an, like a parallel dimension and I'm getting to live that life now because the other alternative was not good. So anyway, anyway, again, I keep saying enough about me enough about me, but (laughs) anyway, so, okay. So you started quilting, you said around 2011, 2011. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so then how, how long was it before you started to think business or did, did, cause you do t-shirt quilts mostly, right? Is that, I do. Yeah. That's t-shirt quilts and memory quilts are the bulk of what I do. Um, designing and, and writing and selling patterns is kind of the cherry on top. That's like my fun, creative outlet, um, Mm -hmm. which also is kind of, well, I'll back up. Okay. So how long was it? Um, I really don't know because what happened was I started to do quilts and then somebody said, can you make a t-shirt quilt in there? And we're going to circle back to that question because that's something I definitely want to touch on here in a minute. Mm -hmm. Um, And I was like, well, I don't know. How hard could it be? I don't know. Um, Turns out it was kind of hard if you don't know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So I used all the wrong interfacing and Mm -hmm. used the wrong thread. And I really didn't know what I was doing, but I got it done. Um, And then, you know, as soon as one person hears like, oh, she does this, then it's kind of like a floodgate slowly starts to open. It makes me think of like a dam that's been shut for a really long time. Yeah. And when you first open it, like all the mud and all the stuff has to come out and it takes a really long time. And then it's just like this gush of water. So yeah. I am in the phase of my business where it is the nonstop gush of water, mm-hmm. um, which is a blessing and a curse, especially if you're somebody who has struggled with people pleasing in the past. 
Um, yeah. I cannot please all the people because it turns out I really actually only have 24 hours in a day. Who knew? <laughs> right? <laughs> it it right? actually does not change. Yeah. These are the boundaries and the confines that we have to work with. Yeah. Um, so what, what happened was, is I started to get healthy again. Um, mm -hmm. I found some natural supplements and um, different food changes and things that were mm -hmm. really helping my issues. And, mm -hmm. you know, I was coming out of that flare, that hot spot. I was, things were getting back together. I was starting to be able to work out again. I was mm -hmm. running again. You know, I was doing a lot of really great things. And um, a lot of my friends at church saw what was going on and they were like, um, psst, we created a position just for you and we really want you to come back. So come on in, let's talk about it. Let, me, let us show you what we've got. Yeah. And I was like, ah. <laughs> I don't know how long I'm going to be healthy, but I'm willing to start at like this many hours, just a teeny tiny little this many. Right. Um, and I still don't understand how God works because a lot of times it does not make sense at all while you're in it. But I eventually worked up to full time. It was the absolute best job. I loved it so much. Um, I got to meet with all the new people coming into the church, mm. kind of help them find their way, try to help them find their people. You know, mm -hmm. like it's, oh my gosh, I just loved it so much. It was, it was such a win for me. Um, but then our son was diagnosed with general anxiety disorder when he was in eighth grade and he was struggling to make it through the day mm. every day over mm. and over and over. So, um, our church and the city that my husband was working for were in the same city. And it felt like rock, paper, scissors in the parking lot of the church almost every single day. What does your schedule look like? What is yours? Who can go to the school? Who can pick him up? Mm -hmm. And um, I just had this, <laughs> I had to come to Jesus quite mm -hmm. literally um, yeah. bawling my eyes out at home. And I realized even though he called me back into ministry and this perfect position was, was created and I was thriving and it was awesome. And I loved everything. I loved every facet about that position. Mm -hmm. Um, just as soon as he built the whole thing up, God was like, great. Now I need you to walk away. And I was like, I don't want to, I, I really right. love this boy, but he's kind of falling apart and I don't know how to do that. Yeah. I don't know how to help him. I don't, I don't have a clue what I'm doing with general anxiety disorder, how to read him, how to help him, how to anything. Mm -hmm. And, um, it was just so clear both to me and my husband, we, um, he actually came home one day while he was on duty and we stood on the driveway and I just bawled and bawled and bawled and was like, I don't want to quit. I don't want to. And he's like, I know, but I have all the benefits at my job. And I'm like, yeah, you do. Okay. I guess it's me. I'm the one. Yeah. And it has been it's just been a gift. Um, those years I will, I will forever be grateful that my son and I got to bond through really hard things. And I feel like hard is just a recurring theme in mm -hmm. our family's life, whether it's my health, his health, my husband's job, the way people view his job. Um, mm -hmm. so much hard over yeah. and over and over again, rinse and repeat. Mm -hmm. Um, but what a gift that I was not tied to somebody else's schedule. Mm -hmm. And I had already begun to grow a business before I got well and went back to work at the church this, that second time, mm -hmm. because I just jumped right back into it. And it was like, okay, well, I'll try to go back to this thing. Mm -hmm. And, um, oh my gosh, there were just so many blessings in his, especially in his high school years. Um, he was in marching band, which is a big deal in Texas. And I got mm -hmm. to be present for a ton of it. We had so many shared experiences. I got to volunteer my brains out and it was amazing. Yeah. Um, it was a lot of hard work and a lot of sweat because it's hot in Texas all the time. Yeah. Um, I wear flip-flops the majority of the time, even now <laughs> in December, I'm wearing flip-flops. Um, but what a gift to have that time with him and to be able to create my schedule around what he was doing and be available to take him to different appointments or therapies or whatever he needed. Mm -hmm. Um, gosh, it was just such a gift. So yeah, probably towards the tail end of his high school years is when my business just grew and grew and grew. And I eventually had to, this past year, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to move all of my bookings from paper in my office. Like I built myself a, a spiral scheduler that literally <laughs> has tabs to 2028 because people sincerely ask me, Hey, can you pencil me in seven years from now when my daughter is going to be a senior? And I'm like, no, <laughs> no, it cannot. I yeah. will do four years at a time and that's it. Yeah. Um, but, you know, tapping into this whole, can you make a t-shirt quilt for me? Yeah. Um, 
I don't know if you're familiar with Elizabeth Chapel from Quilter's Candy, but mm-hmm. she, I say loosely mentored me because I think it was really more conversation where she was pushing me. Mm. Um, and it was all through Instagram. You know how you can like send like a 59 second voice memo at yeah. a time. Yeah, There were a lot of those between the two <laughs> of us over this past year. And um, I'm just, I'm grateful for the way she poured into me and she just pushed me and she was like, okay, I see you working so hard to build this design business because with all of my, I have, now I have technically on paper, I have six autoimmune diseases, but Mm -hmm. um, I do still have an array of long COVID issues that nobody Mm -hmm. could seem to really put their, their thumb on and go, Oh, this is what that is. So Mm -hmm. apparently that some of the latest research has said that, um, and I don't know if this is still true or not, but from my last appointment, when I was having some brain issues over the summer, Uh, The neurologist said that they're starting to think that long COVID could be categorized as another autoimmune disease, which I'm like, just put it on my tab. (laughs) Yeah, might as well. (laughs) We'll just round it out with lucky number seven. Seven is a holy number. So sure. Let's just, let's go to seven. Why not? not? Why not? (laughs) Anyway, I am fully aware that I will not always be able to crawl around on the floor and make t-shirt quilts and memory quilts and all the things that I do regularly. So Part of starting the design side of my business is kind of also like my long-term goal of, I want to be able to opt out of doing quilts for other people when I can feel that the time is right for my body. And it takes a long time to build something new, to build something from nothing. It takes a long time. Mm -hmm. So by starting now, I say now it's technically a year and a half ago, but by starting now, hopefully by the time when my body is giving out to the point where I really just, it doesn't make sense for me to be quilting for other people anymore, then the design side of things will be big enough that I can, you know, kind of close the door kindly on one and just be fully present with the other. Yeah. Um, but in that, I have been working on creating an entire pattern system for quilters. It's not necessarily for brand new people. So even mm-hmm. though I just said, you know, I really want to focus on building or designing patterns that are for beginners. Right. Technically you're going to need all of the quilting beginning things before you can tackle something like what I'm building. Mm -hmm. Um, But the name of it is called t-shirt tiles. And the whole idea of it is I give you very simple instructions on how to measure the clothing items that you have and figure out which pattern is the right pattern Mm -hmm. based on the clothing items that you have. So Mm -hmm. There's three that are for um, baby and toddler sized items. And then there's four that are for youth and adult size items. Mm-hmm. Um, I have six of them completely written. I'm writing the seventh one. I was working on the seventh one yesterday. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, I, I try really hard. One thing I've learned a lot from my very first class that I took was Alderwood Studios has a pattern writing academy. She usually, I think that starts in January. So she's probably starting to promote it now. Um, But if you look on Instagram, Alderwood Studios, if you just go and look up her profile, you can very easily get to her Pattern Writing Academy information. Mm -hmm. Um, That was a really great launching course for me. And that's actually how I met all the girls in Nine Patch Quilt Collective. Um, We hit the jackpot of all jackpots in a group. I mean, we talk about it all the time. It's, it's, absolutely insane that we were put together by somebody else we didn't know none of us knew each other at all and we were complete strangers and we completely hit it off and it's been incredible from day one so um her class is fantastic with the the legit foundational information you need to know how do you write a pattern what do you need to be aware of what is tech editing why do you need pattern testers like all the basics of what is super important. Mm-hmm. Amber's class is definitely that. But then several of us have now taken Elizabeth's course from Quilters Candy. Mm-hmm. She also offers a pattern writing course. And that one is like the Super Bowl of pattern writing courses. So mm-hmm. unless you're ready to take it to, you know, it's like, okay, I just want the foundation. I need to figure out like, what is this thing? How do I do this thing? let's practice. Let's put something together. That is definitely Amber's class. But if Mm. you're like, I am full throttle, ready to start a business and I'm ready to hit it hard, then that's Elizabeth's class. Um, and I'm grateful for both because I needed both and I have Mm -hmm. gained extreme value from both. Um, but one of the things I've learned from both of them is it's very important to have things tech edited and tested. Mm -hmm. So that's the phase that I'm in right now with these patterns. I was really hoping to launch them at the end of December, Mm -hmm. but it might 
<laughs> honestly, it might be more like the end of January, but I just, I want it to be right. I don't yeah. want to rush it. I don't want to confuse people. You know, I don't want to hand them something that's just really crappy. I mean, yeah. we have all purchased a pattern before and we get excited and we open it up and we're like, what the heck is this? Yeah. This, this diagram doesn't make sense. I don't even know what she's showing me in the thing or he's showing me in the thing. Mm -hmm. um, there are uh, erroneous words all throughout that. Like, did anybody ever read this before it was even printed? Like, I don't yeah. want to be that guy. You know, right. I just, yeah, I want to have a good finished product that I can hand over to people and be excited about it, promote it well, and be like, I am setting you up for success because yeah. I know as a quilter, you are getting that question. Yeah. Hey, can you make me a t-shirt quilt? Because you're a quilter, which mm -hmm. is like going to a place that does oil changes and says, you know, yeah. like, Hey, can you fix the damage on this side of my driver's door? Because somebody hit me the other day and it's like, well, we don't actually do that here. Right. <laughs> so yeah. I feel like yeah. that's what a lot of quilters say is like, I don't actually do that here. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. But I want to change that for you. I want you to be able to have the information that you need. And, um, you know, I've had, I think three or four different people have read through different versions of it as, as I've been building this thing over the past six months. And, um, every single one of them has said, I feel like you were sitting right next to me, holding my hand, telling me exactly what to do step-by-step. Step. Um, and it just, it, it makes me so excited because I want other people to have these, this tool and especially in this day and age. And I, Every time I say day and age, I feel like I sound like my own grandmother, but um, <laughs> I, mean, yeah. I mean, I am getting closer to 50, so it's okay. I guess I can say day and age and get away right. with it, yeah. but um, I feel like it's important to have something that you can fall back on mm -hmm. if things in the business world don't work out for you. And I'm not saying that you can make the same amount of money, um, but it has been really helpful to us. Every single dollar that we needed for marching band for our son came mm -hmm. from my business. Mm -hmm. Not a dime came out of our family budget. I paid for every single thing for all four years from t-shirt quilts. Wow. And um, I really want to give people that tool so that they too can turn around and go, yes, I can do that as well. Because I'm going to tell you, there is no shortage of people who want to have this done. Right. Um, I'm constantly turning people away in 2024, I think my first opening is in August right now, but then in 2025, I'm completely booked from January through May. Those are, oh. I call those the senior months, seniors yeah. in high school. Mm -hmm. Um, and I have, I do anywhere from eight to 10 quilts a month. It just mm -hmm. depends on the month and what I have going on. I try to pre-plan. So I, now that everything's online, I can like, you know, block out certain months and only take four quilts. If I know we have a wedding or if I know we have a trip or whatever, yeah. mm -hmm. um, but I just really desperately want to give other quilters those tools. So if they are in a place where it's like, man, I could really use an extra $200 a month. It's like, well, sister, you've already got all the skills. You just need the tool and the know-how so that you could make it happen. Yeah. So that's, that's what's coming next for me. And I'm, I'm very excited about it. That's so cool. Yeah. And I just, you know, with my with my quilting business with my mom, we're in that same boat where we get asked almost weekly to make some kind of memory quilt or t-shirt quilt. Yes. And, and we do it because there are a lot of people who will say, no, I don't do that. I won't. They refuse. Yes. And I mean, it can be daunting to work with clothing and different types of fabrics besides quilting cotton, if you've never experienced it. But I think for my mom, especially she, you know, she came from a, her background of sewing, sewing garments and sewing all the things since she was really young. And her grandma taught her how to deal with all the different kinds of textiles and like work with different fabrics. And so she's never really shied away from it. Whereas I was like, yeah, didn't know what to do. And I, I was nervous about it for a while, but the more she's like showed me and, you know, mentored me through it as we've, you know, grown this business together now I like, don't even bat an eye because it's like, Oh no, there's ways to deal with all of this. And, and just that concept of like, yes, that person is gone or, you know, in your case, a lot of seniors graduating, they're, they're entering a new phase. It's like a way to memorialize the past or the, that person. And I don't want to tell somebody, no, I can't help you preserve the memory of your grandma or no, I can't help you make this 
quilt that will allow you to snuggle with the clothing that your dad wore or yeah you know it's like it would yes there's limits to how many you know how many you can do in a month and how many you can make actually make to fruition and yeah. but it's like anybody that's asked unless it's like you know I have a shoe. Can you put that into a quilt? No, I can't do that. But you know what I'm saying? Like sometimes yes. there's some weird asks and I do have to say no to certain things yes. sometimes, yes. but when it comes to memory quilts and, 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 you know, t-shirt quilts like that, it's like, I always want to be able to say yes, because of the magnitude of the meaning behind it and what that is going to mean yes. to the person that's going to receive that quilt. And so Absolutely. Yeah. I'm, in fact, I have, um, right before we got on this call together, I was working on a quilt from baby, baby clothing, which is common. You know, people mm -hmm. want to, um, just, they have a hard time getting rid of, you know, I remember every single thing that we did when my son wore this outfit or whatever. Mm -hmm. and, and I completely understand that. Um, yeah. and this one is so special because it is a crazy cool adoption story. Mm. And, um, on top of that, the, the lady who hired me to make this, her mom was actually going to make the quilt and she passed away this year. Mm. And it is, it is an incredible honor to be asked to do something like this, knowing that someone in her life who was a quilter was going to take on the task. And obviously, you know, something horrible happened and she cannot make that come to fruition. But for somebody to like pass the baton over to you, that is and these are, you know, like they're irreplaceable clothing items. It's, yep. it is just such a huge honor to be able to capture someone's story in such a way in, in, in a tactile way. Like you were yep. saying, you know, snuggle up in the shirts of your dad or, you know, whatever the thing may be. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, even my own son, he, we saved all kinds of things to make him a t-shirt quilt when he graduated from high school. And I gave him the yes, no pass, you know, like we would hold up every single item. He's like, no, not that. No, not, oh, I have a really bad memory with that. I don't want mm. that. I was like, really? Are you sure? But don't you remember? What about this? And I was like, okay, let go. This is his quilt. Let right. him put in it what he wants to put in it. And it is just so fun sometimes to snuggle up under that thing. And just, it's like a flood of memories. Yeah. The rush of man, we had so many cool experiences when we went to San Antonio and remember the crazy thing that happened in Indianapolis and, you know, just yeah, all the things it's, it's literally, so I actually used to make scrapbooks for people when he mm. was an infant. Okay. Um, and then scrapbooks slowly went away. And I think it's really interesting. Again, God is at work and we have no idea what he's doing, but in a way I'm still making scrapbooks for people. It's just with their clothing items. Yep. And, um, I, I really think that's, I don't, I just, I really love being able to capture people's stories for them. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. And that's like one of my favorite, I mean, I love making, you know, traditional patterns or whatever the quilts people want. I love that part too. Cause again, it's like pushing me to try things I've never tried or make new patterns or color mm -hmm. combos I would never think of, but you know, it's just really fun. But then the, the t-shirt and memory quilt side of things is like really what's so precious to me and to my mom. Like we talk about it all the time and like, you know, we'll get comments back from people or, you know, they'll let us know they received their quilt. Not all the time, which is so like, I think people would be surprised to hear how far and few between it is that you hear back from the quilt recipient like hey I got my quilt thank you so much it's just like we send it and we never hear anything from people it's crazy anyway wow. um but usually the the memory quilt people are the ones who will contact back and say oh my gosh thank you so much yeah. like you have no idea what this means to me and we'll just like start tearing up reading these messages because yes. it's like we're so grateful that we're in a position that we can help people with this and for us we have these connections that we can we can relate with these people on and say, we know that this is really important. And so working to give them something of high quality that can be used, that doesn't, it's not going to get folded up and put on a shelf. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. use it, L love on this thing, make it a part of your life instead of, you know, oh, that's just an old thing that gets tucked away in a chest. And I know some people still do that, even though we're like begging them, please use your quilt, <laughs> you know? 
Yeah. So I like yeah. that. You're... I tell people all the time. I say, if you, if you washed it and dried it while your loved one was alive, use it and wash it and use it and wash it. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's all meant to be used and washed. <laughs> yeah. Like it's, it's still nice. a shirt. It's like it's- second time I've had the opportunity to use this phrase but rinse and repeat (laughs) yeah yeah honestly it's it's that like I know that they want to preserve it and make sure that nothing happens to it but at the same time you're right it's like these are clothing items mostly like yeah they've been washed and worn and and used on a body like nothing you're going to do with it as a quilt short of driving over it with a car multiple times, like it's going to, it's going to survive. And, and when you have that intention in mind, when you're making it, it's like, you're look, you're paying attention to those seam allowances. You're making sure you're using the right materials, the right, you know, Interfacing. uh, interfacing the right kinds of threads. The quilting is done in a way to make sure everything holds together. And, Mm -hmm. and I, you know, going from like the first one I ever did for one of my friends to now I'm like, I saw her quilt at her house a few months ago and I was just like, Oh, she's like, what? I'm like, I just, I wish I could have a redo on, on your, on your quilt. She's like, what are you talking about? I love it so much. And I'm like, I was like, I, I don't doubt it. And I'm so grateful that you trusted me to make this for you. I said, I just see so many things that I didn't know back then that I know now that I would never do that I did your quilt <laughs> and but don't you think that's what beginners do they yes. see things on social media and they think yep. mine is never going to look like that yep. I'm never going to be able to fill in the blank yep and for any beginners who are listening yeah I just want to encourage you that like we all started somewhere everybody yep. did we've all had things that didn't line up we've all had something that shrunk and we were mortified or something that bled oh my gosh Ugh. a fabric or a shirt or a something that bled and we were mortified and yep. you know like we have all had all of those things happen, Mm -hmm. but we kept going and we kept learning and we kept trying new things. And I just want to encourage the beginner who might be listening to just keep going, keep trying, keep, I mean, pick a pattern that you might see online. It's like, I have no idea how that comes together Buy it and do it. Even Mm -hmm. if you only do a couple of blocks just to learn a new technique, do it. If there is a, you know, if there's a sew along or something like do it, Yeah. do the things. Yep. Yeah. And I'm, I'm here to second that. I think, I mean, looking back at that, it does make me grateful that I have come this far and it's because I never gave up. I didn't at the time I was like, oh my gosh, I did a stellar job on this quilt. Like I was so proud of it and she clearly still loves it. So it doesn't matter like what I think now, I think because some of the things would have maybe helped longevity of it as a quilt, but overall it's fine. You know, it's going to, it's going to survive. It's fine. There's nothing wrong with it per se. Um, but yeah, that (laughs) the curated things that you see online, aren't always the truth behind what's really happening. And maybe, yeah, the picture of that quilt you're seeing is focused in on the area where things did line up versus Uh maybe a few inches to the right. And you would see a seam that didn't line up because we all mess up all the time. And I think it doesn't matter how many quilts you make, you're going to have an off seam that you have to seam rip and redo because it's just life. It's just humans working with machines and human error and machine error. And sometimes things just don't come together. And sometimes you have to just walk away before you break stuff, come back and it'll work just fine. You know what I'm saying? Like that, that self patience, I guess. Yeah. Patience with yourself and understanding that Sometimes you just have an off day or that it takes time to get to certain places is it's a crucial thing to remember, but it is so hard in the moment when you're like, I just need this to go together. I just need this block to be finished. I'm laughing so hard on the inside right now because (laughs) just yesterday, um, what you can kind of see it actually, for those who watch the video, that leaf block, um, Mm. that's part of my warm woodlands pattern. Uh, And there's a a store here locally where um, she carries the printed booklets of my pattern and she Mm -hmm. has my cover quilt on display. Um, But I put together a project sheet for her where it shows, you know, you can make this pattern in these colors and we have them here in the store. So it's just this really great, kind of like if you went to Joann's or something and there's project sheets posted next to different brands or whatever. Um, 
And I said, hey, why don't you give me just like small cuts of each of these fabrics and I'll make you a sample block so people can at least see what it looks like in your fabric colors. Right. I cannot tell you <laughs> how many times I had to rip apart the seams on my own pattern. <laughs> right. Right. I don't know what I was thinking, but I literally sat at my machine and I was laughing at myself. I'm like, what are you doing over here, Anne? Yeah, <laughs> what are right? you? Snap out of it. Oh my yeah. gosh, you wrote this pattern. You've made it multiple times. <laughs> Get your head in the game. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. It's And it's funny, like you can, it doesn't matter how many seams you've sewn or if it's your own pattern, there's going to just be days where you just cannot get your crap in a pile to do the thing that you know you can do. And it's like, it's okay. We all face it no matter how long you've been sewing again, how many seams you've sewn. I mean, I'm working on this giant, it's a king size and it's a Harry Potter themed quilt. And so all the blocks are different, you know, characters or, you know, items or things from the movies and books wow. and and, you know, they finish at 18 inch. They're, they're free block patterns from Kelly Fannin quilting, Kelly Fannin quilts. I don't, her blog is called, I seriously think this needs stitches. I think is what it's called <laughs> anyway. And they're it's all cute. free. She did like a sew along in 2019. So I'm just pulling blocks from that. And wow, that's very generous. Um, yeah, it is very generous of her. And I cannot wait to like start sharing the blocks online. Cause they're so, they're so fun to make. And because they finish so large, they're, still kind of terrible because there's like a million pieces, but that's just because I'm like you, I want it to be done like yesterday and I still have like 20 blocks to go. So anyway, um, but it, there's just things it's like, I'm, I'm sewing a one and a half inch rectangle to a one and a half, you know, the one and a half inch side of a rectangle to a one and a half inch square. And I this can't shouldn't be get, hard. <laughs> no, I'm like, I can't get this seam to like, I can't, I don't know. I don't know. There was, I yeah. think I re-sewed a seam <laughs> on one, that a one and a half inch piece probably six times yesterday. Cause I could not get it to like stay lined up or my bobbin would nest at the beginning. And so then I, it would like eat the fabric and I'm just like, Oh, I hate that. I was like, I'm going to go downstairs and have a snack. And I like <laughs> my rule of thumb, because I have, I have really struggled with perfectionism mm. probably like from the time I was probably 17, 18 Mm -hmm. up until about 35 ish years old. Um, I, my rule with quilting is I will rip it out two times. Mm -hmm. And if on the third time I sew it, if it's still not perfect, it's good enough. And we're going to keep moving because yeah. there's obviously some reason that it's not lining up and I can either beat my head against a wall or I can move on and find the joy in the next thing. Right. So that's my rule. I will rip it out twice and that's it. Yeah. I mean, yeah, there's a limit. And I think it has to, you have to set limits for yourself. And like that scene yesterday, if, if I, if the machine didn't keep eating the corner, I would have just left it. You know what I'm saying? But yeah. Like, that's different. It's like scrunched. And so I had yes. to like, anyway, it was, it yeah. was a mess, but I'm with you. I think and, and that the phrase is said, so I'm sure people have heard it. Obviously as quilters, you probably hear it a lot, but the, um, like nothing's perfect. It'll quilt out. Once you wash it, you'll never notice it. And it's true. It's like these little minute, and you're so close to it. You're so zoomed in when you're sewing these seams together that until you zoom out and you step back and look at the whole picture, can you go, oh, I can't even see that silly thing that I was freaking out about yesterday or, you know, mm -hmm. we fret about these things that really ultimately you have no control over. Like if it's not yeah. lining up, it's not lining up. Just let it go and move on. And, and I'm like you, I struggled with perfectionism a lot and still have some ugly days with it. But I think quilting and sewing has really pushed me to drop it because nothing is perfect. And sometimes you do have a perfect lineup and you get to rejoice in that and you get to celebrate and you get to show it off to anybody who will look at it. <laughs> and then your next one's going to look like trash. You know, it's just how the cookie crumbles sometimes in sewing, but it's like being able to check your perfectionism at the door is crucial. I think in being able to continue growing in 
in your, the craft in, in your sewing adventures, because if you're always looking for perfection, you're never going to find it and no. you'll freeze, you'll be stuck. Yeah. So yes, you, you've got to check yourself before you wreck yourself. <laughs> yeah. So it's, yeah, it's so interesting. Like that's one of the things I really love about, well, not what, I mean, there's so many things I love about the nine patch quilt collective, but, mm-hmm. um, just even, I guess it was last week, um, Emily, her business name is dreamily and quilting. Mm-hmm. Um, I was showing them how horrible my top stitching was on something. And she was like, okay, but you're not a machine. You're a human being. This was made by a human being on a sewing machine at home. And I think it's lovely. And I was like, I think I really needed to hear that today. <laughs> Right. <laughs> really? I really needed to hear that, Emily. And then Dana, um, her, her business is Carnelian Quilting. Mm. Um, she says all the time, and like, I can even hear her voice in my head. Oh, that'll quilt out. Mm-hmm. Like, like, that's no problem. Oh, that'll quilt out. Yeah. That's keep moving. Keep going. You're yeah. good. That's fine. Yeah. That's literally my mom and I say that to each other at least once a day. Oh, that's going to quilt out. It'll be fine. Yeah. And, and if it only- doesn't, it'll wash out, you know, yeah. because once you wash something and there's puckering and whatever around it, yeah. it's not going to be as blatantly obvious as when you're pressing it and everything is perfectly flat and, right. you know, yeah, it's all good. It, once it gets the quilty crinkle out of the dryer, then it's like, it, nobody cares. They just want to snuggle right. under it. Nobody cares. And right. I mean, obviously if it's glaring because you did right. something wrong yes. then yeah, fix yes. it. But if it's like, fix Oh, it. this is an eighth of an inch off and it looked, nobody cares. Nobody's going to yeah. look at that and go mm, redo the whole thing. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's definitely worth, definitely worth like that reality check. And like, if you have a great group of people who can look at something and, and bring you back into reality, it's so nice. Yeah. Cause yeah. one of my favorite yeah. words is sufficient. Mm. That's sufficient. Mm-hmm. It's not a pass or a fail. It's not a good or bad, but it's sufficient. It'll mm-hmm. do. Let's keep going. Let's, yeah. let's move on to the next thing. What's next. Yeah. Good it's enough sufficient. is yeah. I say I use good enough. Like, yeah, it's, it's good enough. It's doing what it needs to do. The seam allowance is mm-hmm. good. The seam is fine. Nothing's broken. It's good. Just move on. So yeah, yeah. it's the, the sufficiency check or the good enough check is, is it's nice. It's, it's a reminder like, Oh, right. Okay. I do know what I'm doing and I just need to keep going. <laughs> it's easy to get lost in those little, those little mistakes and, and start talking so negatively about yourself. Like, yes. I don't know if you struggle with that, but I think too, and I'm going to loosely connect this back to health things because I also have several health things, issues. And so I can not on the same level as you definitely, but I have been food allergy, weird diagnoses, health issues, whatever. My body just hates me sometimes. And, um, a lot of that has started to heal through a lot of therapy and again, food and health, healthier lifestyle kind of habits and practices. Um, doesn't make it go away, but it, it improves it and helps the bad days not be so bad. But, um, I think that I lost my train of thought. We're talking about good enough. Yes. I think because I might tear up a little bit, but I think because, um, on those bad days, it feels so bad. You can't let anybody else know, like nobody unless they've experienced that same thing or something similar, they can't know how bad it feels to be in that spot when you just literally want to rip the skin off of your body or you just want to chop off a limb because it's not functioning properly (laughs) or whatever the case may be, your stomach is turning inside out and there's nothing you can do about it at the moment. Like those moments feel so gross. And so the good enough is like almost a, it's such a reprieve from the shit that you can feel Yeah, when you're in a flare, when you're in a bad day, when your health is flipping you off <laughs> essentially yeah. and saying, yeah, you don't get to, you don't get to do X, Y, Z today. And you have to just say, okay, well, what I can do is good enough. 
And so it's absolutely, I think through therapy (laughs) again, back to that, because that's always going to be my go-to, but through therapy and through just working on myself outside of therapy and digging in has really helped that mindset of like accepting good enough because perfectionism ran my life for so long. And those thoughts, those, those thought spirals I would get into, I think would almost make the health things worse. Worse. Sure. And so obviously there's so much more to it and I am absolutely not trying to diminish anything that anybody's experiencing because obviously if what it, they're autoimmunes and they're lumped and sometimes doctors don't really know what to do and they just throw whatever they can at it because some things work great for some people and those same very same treatments will not work for the next person and so it's just kind of a toss-up sometimes and so but for me personally I can speak to the impact that therapy has had and the impact that choosing quilting over my career path of having a degree and a master's degree in in education the identity crisis I had stepping away from that and the anxiety I had stepping away from that ultimately led me to a more peaceful situation where I'm not flaring as much I'm not experiencing those bad days as much but anyway so I think people who are experiencing that to it's like yeah you have to just accept good enough whether it's in quilting or whether it's in your day-to-day and you're worthy to exist whether you can get a whole quilt made in one day or you just got out of bed to brush your teeth like both days are good enough days and that's been a huge huge lesson I've had to learn in those these last couple of years which I'm so grateful for but I feel like, well, first of all, I'm sorry that you suffer. Thank you. In every sense of the word, I'm sorry that you suffer. And um, I know just from my own life and the, the amount of people I've met, whether it was, you know, being on staff at a large church or, you know, volunteering with my son's huge marching band or whatever, there are so many people suffering mm-hmm. and Um, there is, you know, you and I texted back and forth about this a little bit, but there is such a fine line when you are someone who suffers, it's important to talk about the really hard and ugly and bad things, Mm -hmm. but it's also really important to choose your audience wisely. Mm -hmm. And, um, I will say that from my own experience, social media is really not the best place for that. Um, people don't hear your tone. They probably don't know all of the things that you've gone through. The algorithms are so weird on social media anyway. Like they may not have seen anything you've posted in eight months. And then all of a sudden they're like, oh my gosh, what happened? You know, what is going on? And yeah. Or, you know, like, what is she whining about? What is that? You know, like everybody Mm -hmm. has their own, their own story that they've got going on in their own heads. And a lot of times it will, um, it will create a filter of how they view other things. Mm -hmm. So if your content is what they're viewing through their filter, it may not come across the way that you're intending for it to come across. And then people may have well-meaning comments that really are not helpful at all. Um, They could be triggering. They could be frustrating. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, why don't you just X, Y, Z? My grandmother has what you have and it worked for her or, you know, whatever. (laughs) Um, Exactly. But I will say that within the quilting world, um, you know, the, the handful of quilt shows that I've been to, Mm -hmm. there are, there are people with walkers, people with canes, people in wheelchairs, people, you know, like the visible disabilities, there's lots of people. Mm -hmm. Um, and then there's a lot of people like you and me who have invisible disabilities. Mm -hmm. And, um, I just want to encourage you, no matter how you're suffering, show up to something. Maybe it's a quilting guild. Um, maybe it's a group on Facebook, you know, maybe it's a a quilting group on Facebook, or, um, if you have a local quilt store and they have classes or, you know, they have opportunities and events or something like that, take what you're passionate about in the quilting world and try to find a way to build community there 
because that outside thing can bring you more joy than you could ever imagine. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, going back to what you said before, quilting is my therapy. I think for me, quilting is my creative outlet Mm -hmm. and quilting is my escape. It's Mm -hmm. my escape from reality. It doesn't necessarily solve anything for me, except that it helps me not think about the pain I may be feeling that day. Mm -hmm. Um, or the difficult doctor's appointment I had the day before or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, but everyone is different. It Mm -hmm. could be therapy for someone. It, it may be the only kind of therapy they can afford. Right. Um, so I just, I don't know. I just want your listeners to hear that we see them and we understand that it's hard and that it's a delicate balance of talking to people about the hard, scary, yucky, gross things and Mm -hmm. not talking to people about the hard, scary, gross things. It's, it is a very difficult ongoing conundrum. (laughs) It really is. (laughs) is Yeah. Sorry. No, it's okay. There, there is no perfect way. Uh, there is no, yeah, you're probably going to mess it up. I know I certainly have, I certainly have talked about it too much to the wrong people and learned, okay, this is not, this is not the right place for me. Right. Um, and that's okay. You know, not mm-hmm. everybody is built the same. We're all built differently, which I think is really good. Cause if everyone was like me, that would be boring. Yeah. Um, that would not be very fun if everyone was like me. So I'm yeah. glad that people are different. Yeah, for sure. And, and I think you're right. Like the experiencing that, like almost vacuum of feeling like you're, you're trying to communicate with somebody or, you know, maybe a group of people that what's going on with you or whatever. And they just can't hear you and you just keep, it's like bidding for connection, but not receiving it back. And so that kind of disconnect feels gross. Cause maybe you're seeking that because you need comfort in that, in your struggle at the moment or in your suffering at that moment. And you're, if you're sharing with the wrong people or you're trying to connect with the wrong people, you won't ever feel connected. You won't ever feel that, that kind of, Oh, somebody who can help me carry this for a minute. And so back to, you know, finding your people. And if you've done enough work to be able to recognize when you're maybe seeking out the wrong kinds of connections or the ones that aren't fruitful for your life. Um, turning to those who maybe you've convinced yourself that you're not good enough for them. Cause I, that definitely was a part of my, you know, dysfunctional thinking is that I wasn't good enough for certain connections or certain friends. And so I would isolate myself from them when really, when I've leaned into those relationships, it's, actually they've become some of the best friendships I have. And I think that fear of letting people see you too. And, and so when you've got like, Oh, I come with baggage too. (laughs) you know, It's like hard to say, please love me. And also I come with all this stuff. And if you're in the right group, if you're in the right crowd, they're going to love you no matter what. And so that's right seeking and everybody has a hard it's very rare that you're in a group of people who have they all have the same difficult things it's very very rare um right you know I have just thinking about some of my friendship circles I have a friend who runs a business with her husband and it's extremely difficult it's it's a health business and especially Mm -hmm. through COVID it was horribly stressful and difficult and Mm -hmm. I have another friend who has an adult daughter who has severe anxiety and Mm -hmm. she's in a phase of parenting where it's like, you're, you're grown and flown and I need you to figure this out for yourself. And that's so hard as a parent to sit on your hands and close your mouth and pray for the best and be ready, willing, and able. Should you get the phone call that says, you know, here, here's what I'm doing. Can you help me with what I'm doing? Mm -hmm. Um, That's really hard. And then I have another friend who had a series of deaths in her family back to back and Mm -hmm. very hard. Mm -hmm. And then I have days where I have a hard time holding my fork or I can't walk to the mailbox or I like this morning, I have a little fun tip for you. So, um, you know, I told you before that I'm waiting to find out if I'm going to need surgery on my shoulder. So I texted my friend last night and I was like, 
do you happen to have an 8 a.m. opening so you can <laughs> cut my hair and style it for me? Because I currently can't do either of those things. And I actually have naturally curly hair. And she's like, how about we do it straight? And maybe it'll hold for a couple of days. And I was like, mm -hmm. I'm down with that. So we, everybody has hard, everyone does. Yeah. And I think isolating is the easy thing. Mm -hmm. because you don't have to put forth the effort. You don't have to face disappointment. You don't mm -hmm. have to figure out how do I this, or do I not say that? Or, you know, like all of those challenging internal struggles, Yeah. but there's so much joy when you put yourself out there in the right way Yeah. with the right people. Yep. There's so much joy to be found. Yep. Absolutely. And we're meant to build each other up. Nobody is meant to do this life alone. No. It's just, I mean, yeah. I'm not going to, I'm not going to get all Bible and scripture on you, but if you go back to the very beginning, there were two people, not one, mm -hmm. two, Adam and Eve. Wow. And then it grew from there. There's always groups of people in mm -hmm. scripture, always. Mm -hmm. I, I just, I fundamentally think we were meant to do life with other people, not isolated and not alone. Yeah. Well, and even, you know, Brene, for those who follow and listen to Brene Brown, which I do love her. Yeah. Love she, her. she always says we're hardwired for connection. We yes. are hardwired to have love and connection in our lives. And so when we don't, when we push people away and we think, oh, that's easier. It's like, okay, but what is your trauma that's keeping you from connecting? You know? Yeah. It's like yes. what is, what is your hard that has kept you from believing that you're worthy of connection? Cause it's not about, oh, good. not necessarily about what other people like, maybe, yeah, you were in a crazy environment and maybe you kept finding yourself in the same environments with the same types of people. And the, those connections were hard and bad, but at the same time, like you were saying, if you heal yourself, if you heal something in yourself enough to start making changes in who you connect with, then you will find people who say, Ooh, I see that hard. And I love you anyway. And amen. And I'm still going to be here for you because those things like they may be a part of who you are and make you who you are, which I'm so grateful for the person that you are, but I'm not going to judge you based on those things because I've got my stuff too. And if I yeah. look at the old you or look at the things behind you and say, mm, I don't think I can like you because of those things, then that's not the kind of connection you want in the first place. So right. it's, it's that that balance of being choosy with who you share your life with and who you share your existence with, but also looking inward enough to do enough self-work to be able to make good, healthy connections. And it's, I think it's hard when you're not shown that if you weren't raised in an environment that shows you how to make healthy connections and have healthy relationships because you just assume they happen naturally or just you don't have to work for them. And so when it's not happening or it's not working out the way you kind of maybe assume yeah. that they do, it can feel really defeating. But, but again, if you go back and you learn more about yourself and meet yourself and try to understand who you are and where your hiccups are and what that means in relationships with other people, then the easier it is to connect with people because you know your own limitations, you know your own boundaries, you know your own yes. kind of like intricacies of like, oh, I did notice that when someone acts this way, I start to act this way or it uh -huh. triggers this in me and that's my own thing. It's not their fault. And so you start to be able to piece those different things together. That's exactly. Exactly. Like I said earlier, I'm looking up a book actually mm. while we're talking, that's exactly earlier when I said, you know, when my friend was posting in, in their group about the renovations or whatever, yeah. and I responded about something about myself. I was like, why did I say that? Right. <laughs> that was totally about me. That was not yeah. at all about the amazing things that they're doing over there. Right. Um, there's two books that I would love to recommend to your listeners. If any of this is resonating with me and if they're still listening, cause this has been long, yeah. it's probably resonating with them. Yeah, yeah. Um, right. um, one of them is a Christian based book. The other one is not, but, uh, Brene Brown rising strong. Mm -hmm. I read it three times post COVID hospitalization. Mm -hmm. And each time I got new things out of it and it was 
a massive tool in my healing Mm -hmm. um, with my therapist. It, It gave me a lot of really great, Brene Brown has such a great way of taking big lofty brainiac type things and breaking them down so that anybody can understand them. Mm -hmm. Um, So rising strong by Brene Brown. And then the second one is by Rebecca with a K R E B E K A H lions L Y O N S. Um, This book is called you are free. Mm -hmm. And the whole concept of it is you you're free to be who you are. You don't have to become something different. Mm -hmm. to fit in somewhere. So, you know, we're talking about do the work on yourself. Um, It's not because we're recommending that somebody becomes somebody that they aren't already, you know, like become somebody else and then you're going to find friends, be who you are, but let's help identify all of the roadblocks that you're, Mm -hmm. you don't even know that you're putting in front of your own way. Mm -hmm. Um, And this book Gosh, I, I, I distinctly re- remember the first time I read it. My husband and my son went on a hiking trip for the weekend and I read it while they were gone and I cried the entire weekend <laughs> and it was so freeing. Mm-hmm. She gave me, she, I mean, like she gives you permission. Hey, mm-hmm. like it's okay to grieve. It's mm-hmm. okay to grieve the loss of your health. Mm-hmm. It's okay to grieve the loss of a loved one. It's okay to grieve the loss of, your favorite pants that you don't fit in anymore, right? Right. Like these all, some of these feel like really silly things, but they're not, they're They're not not silly at all. So you are free by Rebecca Lyons was Mm -hmm. life giving to me. And then rising strong was life changing for Mm -hmm. me Two two very different things, both extremely important in my healing process. Yeah. And it takes work. It takes work to grow. It really does. And I think you're, I think, yeah, it can get missed that like, well, if I, I need to change everything about myself to be accepted and loved. It's like, no, the, the point of turning inward and and working on yourself is like I said, to meet yourself, to understand who you are so that you can more authentically show up as who you are instead of internalizing all these external messages of like, well, if your hair looks like this and your body looks like this and your clothes look like this, then people are going to like you. If you make these kinds of quilts, then people are going to like you. If you use this type of fabric, then, then you're going to have more quilty friends and more people will follow your Instagram and yada, yada, yada. But it's not about that. It's about looking inside and saying, who am I? Shut learning to shut out those external voices when you can learning to accept what is good quality, maybe feedback that maybe isn't explicit feedback, but implicit in how people are responding to you and your behaviors. Yeah. Versus good. That's good. Yes. Versus changing everything about yourself to fit in. And back to Brene Brown again, the first book I read of hers was um, The Gifts of Imperfection. Mm-hmm. And in that, she talks about that as well. Like, you don't have to fit in because that's not true belonging you, you find belonging when you make those, those connections and find, you know, compassion for others and for yourself and from others and, and acceptance. And, and you will find those people, the, the more you stop trying to fit in, the more authentically you arrive. And if you want anything to go differently in your life, you have to show up differently. You have to be brave enough to say, you know what, I'm not going to back down the next time my uncle makes a snarky comment about the fact that I have food allergies and have a lot of dietary limitations. <laughs> Let me tell you what, family gatherings are not fun sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> but like the more relaxed I became about it, as far as like, you know what, I'm just going to bring food I can eat. And if anybody says anything, I'm just not even going to respond anymore the less I had to defend myself, the less I felt like I had to defend myself because people weren't commenting on anything anymore. They weren't getting the reaction that they were used to getting because I showed up differently. And that's obviously a very specific example to me, but it was again, something that came up in therapy. Like this is really hard. Thanksgiving, Christmas, whatever it is, whatever family gathering it is, have, they have become really hard because I'm so tired of hearing snarky comments about my food. I'm eating, I'm eating food. It's not like I'm starving myself, 
but I just can't eat certain things or I choose not to eat certain things. And chances are you're actually eating real food instead of processed food. hundred percent. And that is not, that's hard. It's, it's hard yeah. for my own people sometimes. Cause I, yeah. I try really hard not to eat dairy because it causes an issue with one of my autoimmune diseases. And then mm-hmm. gluten causes an issue with another of my auto, you know what I mean? Yeah. So mm-hmm. I don't have to stick to it hard fast. You know, I don't have celiac disease. I'm not going to end up in horrible paint. Well, I might, but anyway, right. I, right. I digress, yeah. but, um, getting away from the process, like, Hey, we're going to buy this prepackaged frozen, whatever, and just heat it up for dinner. It's like, you guys eat that. And I'm going to eat something else. Mm -hmm. I'll put something else together. And in the beginning, that was really hard. It was like, what, our food isn't good enough for you. Right. And and they didn't actually say that, you know, like my, my husband would never say that, but it was a learning curve. Mm -hmm. It was, we all had to learn and we all learned differently. And, And it, it took each of us a different amount of time and exposure and whatever to all get to the place where it's like, okay, it's better for mom if she doesn't eat what we're eating. Mm-hmm. Um, do you have something that you can make if we eat this or should we just scrap it all together and find something that's inclusive instead? And I appreciate that so much. Right. It's, it's, I, so much. It makes me feel seen and heard and valued for the difficulties that I could have if I ate what you were eating, you know, right. it's like, they're, yeah. they're not just living in the moment. They're able to think down the road for, for me, for my benefit. And I'm grateful for that. And that's, yeah. that's a big deal yeah. when you have people in your life that are willing to do that. So again, yeah. I'm sorry that you suffered. It's, I'm sorry that you it's suffered. <laughs> it is hard. It's, <laughs> it's, yeah, it is hard. But I think again, it goes back to that. Like, don't take it personally. It's like, it's yeah. not about me. It's, I just, I'm doing what I have to do just because someone else doesn't get it. Doesn't mean that I'm going to change what I know is best for me. And I think that goes with quilting too. I mean, it can come back to that, that concept of like, you can only do what you can do. And maybe you're not as prolific as some of these quilters online seem to be, but I think there's a lot of like front loading or, or I don't know, back loading of like getting a whole bunch of stuff done, taking a whole bunch of pictures, pre-making content. And then it's shared over time where it's like, it looks like they're just in the moment taking a picture or in the moment making this real and it can feel overwhelming and daunting. Well, if that's not your cup of tea, then don't drink it. You know, you don't have to. And I know there's all these things like, well, the algorithm, this and this and this, it's like, well, if you want this, then you have to X, Y, Z. It's like, first get real with yourself. Do you even want those things? Or are you just thinking you want it because the whole world is telling you that you're supposed to want that? And you know, what's realistic for you. And, and I find for me, the, the accounts that I follow or the people quilters that I follow that seem to show up more authentically. And again, I say seem, cause I don't know what they're doing behind the scenes, but yeah, exactly. Seem to show up more of themselves versus some pretty curated photo that makes me feel like crap about myself. (laughs) Um, those are the ones I want to be around more. Those are the ones I seek out their content more because I want to see the realness. I want to connect to that realness of, of not the person on the pedestal because they're perfect and nobody can touch them, but the one that's on my level that I can reach out and hold their hand and say, I need you right now. Or, you know, I just need to see someone else in this same boat as me. And that is more, that authenticity is more connection making than the pretty curated, every post looks the same and feeds your beautiful Instagram tiles, you know, it's like, but I got to tell you it's as a business owner, that is a catch 22 because how much, again, you have to know your audience and how much of me Mm-hmm. And my story should be present in my business stuff. Yep. And I, I feel better about having a business where they're separated. Mm-hmm. Like I want, I want my business audience to know some things about me, Sure. Um, but like a lot of the things that we've shared here, like this, not that's my business, Instagram and business, Facebook are not the places for those. Right. Um, it's, it's very hard as a business owner. And, you know, a lot of the things that I've learned in the courses that I've taken is you are your brand, 
Mm -hmm. everything you produce, all the content that you post, that is your brand. So what is, what story is your brand saying? Is your brand saying that you're taking the time to learn different photography lighting and you're, excuse me, you're getting really good rock solid photos that are nice and bright. People can actually see the fabrics. They can see how the pieces come together. Or are you taking a picture like the lighting in my office is terrible and Mm -hmm. it looks like a decent size room that's nice and bright, but I literally have three lamps (laughs) over here. I have one window and it creates shadow in the entire room. So I actually do not typically do any pictures of things in my office. I take them to other parts of the house or outside or whatever, Mm -hmm. because I do want to have content that's attractive to other quilters. Yeah. Um, But at the same time, I don't want anyone to ever think that my life is perfect and bright and airy and all the things, because as we've just discussed, it is not always like that. Mm -hmm. Um, So it is, phew, that is a hard, that is a big catch 22. And it It is a tough line to walk. Yeah, it is. And cause you can't like, you can know what you like to consume, but that doesn't always translate into what you're, what you create for your business and what your the face of your business looks like. And I think I'm super guilty of just like not really putting in a ton of time to, into, you know, getting the perfect lighting and getting the perfect scene set. And, you know, more than anything, I'm looking at the texture of the long arming versus looking at the whole quilt. And so like the rest of it doesn't really matter to me in that moment. We're just kind of sharing snippets here and there, but, and I think part of that is that I get a little self-conscious, like I'm in the room in our studio with my mom and I don't necessarily know like how she's going to take it if I start making some like super curated thing (laughs) or I'm like I mean she obviously knows I need to take pictures and I do all the social media so she's not like you're stepping on my toes by doing that you know it's not that I think I just it's like a self-consciousness thing and so it's like one of those things where I have to get over that to be able to do that but again it goes to that fine line of like okay what do I consume great what do I like about that and then and then pulling what makes sense for, for me and our business and what I'm making as content for my business. And like, yeah, like you said, it's like, how much do you show? How much do you, do you curate something pretty versus the realness of what you're doing? And, um, yeah, like how do you embody your brand and, and are people connecting with it or do they think yeah. you're just a schlub off the streets trying to make a buck yeah. off of them you know it's like and I think the majority of us um pattern designers um quilters for hire the majority of us work out of our homes right mm-hmm. like I think there's very few people who actually have a separate office or separate space um yeah so the the tricky part there is yes it is a casual environment yes my uniform is usually t-shirt and leggings and yeah. flip-flops um, and also I am a professional right? and I treat my customers with a very professional attitude. I have an agreement that they sign. Mm-hmm. Um, I take deposits. I have a website, you know, mm-hmm. like it's not, this yeah. is not a pencil and paper. Um, you know, you can write me a check situation. This is a, everything's going to be done digital because that's the way that the world is going. And, mm-hmm. you know, there's receipts for everything. There's invoices for everything. I have taxes. I have to pay. I have reports. I have to print, you know, this is a professional business absolutely, in a very casual setting. (laughs) So I think, I think if you can change your frame of mind and view other quilters and designers in particular, as, um, especially people who are trying to build a brand, for Mm -hmm. themselves, um, their pattern brand, their fabric brand, whatever that may be Mm -hmm. like, this is their professional account. Yeah. Um, and if you think about, I mean, Nike is not my most favorite company. I don't know why it keeps coming into my brain, but Mm. if you think about Nike, they would never show you the messy behind the scenes, all the desks in the office with the cables hanging out. Right. Like they, that's not what they would do because they're a professional company. Right. Um, so I think some of that is, 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 changing our mindset to appreciate the fact that people are really working hard to build professional looking branded yes. content. Yeah. Um, and yeah. it's, again, it's not necessarily where you're going to find, in fact, even in our nine patch quilt collective, 
I think every single one of us has a separate Instagram for our personal things Mm -hmm. than we do for our business things. Yeah. Um, And we met in our business setting and it wasn't until, gosh, I think it was just like three months ago, maybe we were like, Hey, do you guys have personal Instagram accounts? (laughs) Right. And we've yeah. been together for a year and a half and it never really even dawned on us. So right. um, that's, that's kind of funny, but yeah, yeah. I think, I think it's good to keep them separate. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I have a hard time when people bring their personal political beliefs into the setting of mm-hmm. their professional lives, but I can also appreciate that that's a lot of what art is. Mm -hmm. It's bringing your beliefs and your, your heart and your suffering and Mm -hmm. all the things are coming to life through your art. So again, that's a, I'm not going to say anything bad about the people who do use their platforms to talk about social or political issues. Mm -hmm. Um, That's their choice. And that's what they do. That's probably not something that you'll see on my professional account, but I don't think it means that one is right. And one is wrong. I think it's a personal choice Yeah, and they're both okay. Right. For sure. And it's, yeah, it's choosing again, it goes back to that choosing how you want to be perceived or what you are put, yeah. like, what are you putting out there? And what are you building? What are you building and what's going to be the perception of that? And, and right. If, if your goal as a person or as a business is to bring light to certain political or social, um, ideas or, you know, use your platform in that way, then great. Then that's, then do that. That's your goal. Great. Yeah. And I think, yeah, mixing the two, if it wasn't previously part of what you were doing and then all of a sudden you start, it might confuse your people if they didn't know certain things about you, which is fine. Like it's not, again, it's not wrong or bad. It's just, again, yeah. What's your brand? What are you putting out there? And so I think it is as a business owner and someone who I also try to keep some of the personal stuff out of the business side of things. And it is kind of hard and well, some ways because I'm on here kind of sharing my life sure. with other quilters, but at the <laughs> same time, it's like, I also want to be a safe space for people to say, this is what I've experienced in the quilting world. Here's how I show up. And this is what I want people to get from, from what I'm putting out there. Then, you know, that's, that's my only goal. I'm not here to drive. I think, I guess my goal is to, to hopefully create and and inspire more open-minded thinking and opening ourselves up to, to just different things, different ideas, different experiences. And we can, again, get so isolated and stuck on our own experience and what our own kind of trajectory has been. And so getting to hear from other people and what they've experienced and how they've gotten where they are is like, oh, right. I'm just a tiny little piece of this huge, huge, huge thing. That's way bigger than me. And it kind of helps put me in my place, which is great. (laughs) Not to say that I'm like out there with some cocky attitude, but I think, yeah, those, the connections that have been made. And then also the reality check of like, right. Things aren't that big and scary they all are also big and scary at the same time and, and finding the, the, the balance in that is kind of, I guess, where, where I live yeah. at the moment. Yeah. So anyway, there's room at the table for everyone. Yeah. There's, if you have a podcast idea, there's room for you. If you yep. have a pattern design, there's room for you, a fabric yep. design, there's room for you. There's so much room mm-hmm. for everyone and their ideas. And there are people who just want to make things. Mm-hmm. They don't want to have anything to do with designing or creating, you know, the back end of things. Mm-hmm. They want to take the finished product and put their own spin on it with the things that they like, the colors they like, the fabrics they like, and they want to build it. We need everybody. Everybody's important in the process. Yep. Everyone is. And yep. there's room for everyone. 100%. 100%. And it's it's a beautiful thing when when you can find so many people who just want to show up and create and inspire each other and cheer each other on regardless of anything else. And, you know, it's out there just going back to finding your people. It's like, it's out there for you. You just have to know, you have to know how you show up in order to find that. So that's right. That And what your, what your hot buttons are and why are those hot buttons? Yep. 
why does that bother you so much? What is the, what is the hidden story that's somewhere inside you yeah. probably need to meet, meet and make friends with so yep. that you understand, <laughs> Yep. you know, that's, yeah. those are important things. Well, and it's those things that, that bother you that usually are mirroring something to you. We're all just mirrors to each other, right? Like, yeah, not just, but you know, when you see a behavior in someone that really drives you crazy, unless they're actually doing something to harm you, why does it bother you so much? Look in the yeah. mirror for two seconds and take a gander. Like, why is this bothering me? Oh, it's yeah. showing me something that I don't like or a way I've been treated or a way I've behaved that I didn't necessarily like that is kind of poking at that. And, and it's just interesting if you, if you kind of step back and take a perspective of that, like don't take things personally. And what is, what's being mirrored to me, like it can change so many things for you. <laughs> it can yeah. lead to so much more self-acceptance too, because you start to understand yeah. yourself and learn to be able to accept who you are versus hiding it or masking it or changing or fitting in. And there's so much to be said for belonging to yourself first and then letting everybody else have a piece of you. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. <laughs> well, we I don't have know. I I think we might have just created a two-parter. I don't know. It, it might be your first two-parter. I've that was a lot. Of, that was a yeah. lot of really good stuff. Really good stuff. I'm really yeah. grateful that you asked me to be on your podcast and yeah, share some good stuff, some hard stuff, some upcoming stuff. And yeah, yeah, I know it's like we've kind of diverted from quilting, but I think, I think there's just so much more behind the scenes, you know, that we see again, we see people's curated face, what they show. And then, but then there's the person behind it all. And so I am so grateful that you were willing to share what you did with us and, and be here for my listeners and for me. And I, I told you in our chats, like in our texting that I'm just like, so it's so relieving to, to be able to talk to another person who can on some level relate to what you experience on the day to day or especially with health yes. issues and especially when they are invisible a lot of the times it's like oh thank you somebody finally gets it and it's like there's like a level of comfort that immediately comes with that so i really am truly so grateful that that you shared what you did with me and that we could connect on that level but also on so many more things not just our health issues but <laughs> but on our love for creating and and bringing life to people's clothing to create new memories and give them something yeah. tangible to hang on to for lost loved ones. And it really is such an important part of, I think the quilty world that kind of gets shoved to the side. Cause people are like, I don't want to mess with that, but it's really, to me, it's really important. And it's a really big piece of, of why I get to have the business I have. And so I love that we can connect on that as well, because it's, it feels really big and feels really important. So absolutely using your talents to serve somebody in a way that they cannot serve themselves mm -hmm. will never be a waste of time. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh my gosh. Oh. <laughs> I have just loved this conversation so much and yeah, I do think we need to have another episode in the future to talk about more <laughs> things, but I am so excited to see your t-shirt tiles patterns come out. And I appreciate all the work that you're putting into making them and honoring the, the quilters who are going to be picking up those patterns and making t-shirt quilts for themselves. And, um, any, any kind of thought behind making things easier for, for new and maybe not so experienced quilters, but maybe they have just enough to get them through. It's like, I just see that. And I appreciate it so much because experiencing bad patterns is so disheartening sometimes. So when you can see that someone is putting a lot of time and love and care and attention into what they're making, it means, it means a lot. So thank you for that. And I'm so excited to see those released. 
Thanks. Me too. It's, it's been a long time coming. And um, after the patterns are released, I actually pushed away a bunch of things in my schedule for next summer. And I'm really hoping to write an online course. Mm -hmm. um, those will be geared more towards beginners. So we're going to walk through everything one step at a time. We are going to make a quilt from beginning to end. Mm -hmm. We're going to walk through the whole thing step by step. So, you know, if, if anybody is still listening after all this time of us <laughs> chatting, <laughs> you know, if you, if you heard like the t-shirt towels written patterns are really more of an intermediate level, you, you do have to know the basics of quilting mm -hmm. um, in order to get through that. And you're like, oh shoot, that's not me. If you can just hang on, I promise something else is coming for the people who are brand new and they're like, I'm trying, but I don't get it. I don't, I just need someone to hold my hand. Mm -hmm. I'm your girl. I'm going to hold your hand. Just not yet. <laughs> yeah. Right. Again, back to there actually are only 24 hours in a day. So I am yes. working on it. I am trying. I have had an outline written since May. <laughs> mm. I just haven't had the time to put it all together. So yeah, that will be coming. So okay. I see you, I see you quilters and I, I'm definitely, I have you on my radar. Yeah. Oh, well, that's perfect. And I love that because yeah, it can be daunting. And that idea of like somebody walking you through start to finish. Cause I think there are a lot of tutorials out there that assume you have certain knowledge pieces that maybe you don't have. And so it, it does feel a little bit scary. So I love that you're putting that together and we'll definitely be watching for that. And you know, once it comes out and it's something I can share social media wise, then I will definitely be celebrating that with you and sharing that to all of our followers as well. And because I think that that's, it's so great. It's like, I want to bring more people into the quilting world. So whenever I find like resources or people that are, that are making things to make it easier for people, I'm like, yes, okay, let's do this because yeah, there's lots of us out there who want to get into it. It just, maybe you don't have anybody in your life to help you get into it, or you're too intimidated to go into your quilt shop and say, I need to start from square one. How do I get there? And not feel like you have to spend thousands and thousands of dollars just to get started. So yeah. Thank so you excited. for this girl. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. I've appreciated it. It's been, it's been fun. It's been good to get to know you. It's been yeah. fun to share in an appropriate way. Yeah. <laughs> it's, right. It's been good. So thank yeah. you.